talking and later on session will be posted on uh, Power Platform YouTube channel of uh, Germany Power Platform community. Also, if you would like to join us and be, be on track for what is happening, who is coming, join us also on a meetup page. And like every time our faces are already boring, so myself and Christian again host for today. And just to announce when we come back from our well-deserved summer break and when we uh, listen to the great session we have today, just announcement for September. It's uh, quite action-packed again, uh, beginning of September with Matthew Roche and uh, Data Culture with Power BI, then Gerhard with a new session with uh, Databricks and Power BI, and then Marcus, end of September, with modeling your data in the star schema. So hopefully you join us also after the summer, we are all, all rest and ready for new learnings and new opportunities. Also October and, and November are, are quite full already. So anybody interesting for having a session, reach out, send us an email, reach out on the meetup or just contact me or Christian on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. And not to do it too long, so our today main guest, and uh, I'm proud to announce here, colleague from Avanad, James Dales, and he will be presenting us today a lot of new things which were released actually yesterday. All right, James, yeah, yesterday around mapping in Power BI. So James, welcome. Thanks for uh, having, uh, great for having you here. Thanks for uh, letting, putting us on your list and welcome from Stuttgart Power BI user group. Well, firstly, thank you ever so much for inviting me. And uh, yeah, as you said, um, what I'm going to uh, demo today was only released yesterday and as a result, I only finished creating the uh, demos this morning, so um, there's a high chance it'll all go badly wrong, but fingers crossed it won't. Let's see what happens. So I'll share my screen and we will get, get into it. So a quick intro. Um, from me then. So if you don't mean, know me, I'm James Dales. I'm a director at Avenard uh, based in the UK. I'm a fast track solution architect, um, Microsoft MVP, and I am one of the co-leaders of a London Power BI user group. And back in 2019, I um, was let loose on the Power BI code base. And you may find that uh, even if you haven't been using maps in Power BI, you may have been using some of the features that were released back in 2019 that um, I was lucky enough to be allowed to contribute to. But today I'm going to talk maps. Um, quick agenda. So um, essentially I'm going to talk about a map visual that I've created and have been working on for a number of years now called Icon Map. So I'm going to talk first about why why Icon Map, why I created it. Very quickly cover a bit of its background and history. Quick run through the features, and then I'm going to spend probably 90% of today's session in back-to-back -back demos, basically running through a a load of the features and a bit of a focus on some of the newer ones. And then I'll finish off by talking through the roadmap about what the plan is for Icon Map and what's coming next. So I guess why do we need a custom visual for maps in Power BI when actually there's five map visuals that already come with Power BI? Field map, shape map, map, arc, GIS maps, and the new kid on the block, Azure maps. Well, I think part of the issue is the mapping capability in Power BI, let's be honest, it's probably not its strong point. Um, I mean, let's take shape map as an example. Um, it's only the only way of providing your own geographies into 
a out of the box map in Power BI and it hasn't made it out of preview for what's probably now about five years. And the other maps, field map and map, are still limited to three and a half thousand data points. ArcGIS is a little bit different in that it wasn't created by Microsoft. It's created by a dedicated mapping company, Esri, and actually it's a really powerful visual. But to make the most out of it, you really need to pay for an Esri subscription and ideally have the backup of a Esri server in the background. And then Azure Maps, well, Azure Maps is still in preview um, and it's got a long way to go. It shows promise. It's actually based on a really powerful uh, open source mapping framework created by Mapbox. So the potential is there for it to be really great, but there's still a long way to go before it's uh, as capable as it needs to be. Obviously, they're all my own views, but um, I don't think too many people would disagree with that. So the community have really made up for it, and this list is almost certainly out of date already. There are loads of custom visuals now available in AppSource to fill that gap um, and try and provide you know, some of the features that aren't in those out of the box visuals. But there isn't really one visual that caters for all requirements. Most of these are, have quite niche features um, that address one or two of those different requirements for what you might need in the map. Um, and there's a couple of really powerful ones in here too. I mean, it's definitely worth calling out the map box visual, which is, you know, is probably the most performant map visual there is for Power BI. But I'm going to talk about icon map and I'm not going to talk about the icon map that was until this week available in in app source. So let me give you a bit of background about where it all came from. So it must be probably back in in the early days of Power BI, probably beginning of 2017, we had a number of customers coming to us um, and to be frank, Microsoft as well, saying, look, we've got these customer requirements that uh, we can't fill with the out of the box visuals in Power, Map, uh, in Power BI. And this was even before um, the ArcGIS visual was released, long time before Azure Maps. Um, so we, ended up building or I ended up building a map visual for a an initial customer requirement and then we had others come through as well which required slightly different requirements so I ended up instead of building lots of different bespoke visuals for customers I thought right there's clearly a gap here in Power BI I'm going to build a specific map visual for the community that we can all use and hopefully uh, provide a lot more capability in maps in Power BI. And I released that original version uh, to AppSource in 2018, and it got a fair bit of air time. Um, it was featured in one of the early Guy in the Cube videos, and I had a look at stats actually last week, and it's still being downloaded even last week at about 50 to 100 times a day, almost every day. So it's clearly been used um, out there quite a bit. But that version in AppSource hasn't really changed since its initial release in 2018. And I started adding a lot more features to Icon Map. Uh, I released them on the website iconmap.com. Um, and my intention was to release those to AppSource um, in a new version and update what was already up there. However, in late 2020 or early 2021, Microsoft released a whole load of new capabilities to the Custom Visuals API. The main one of those being the ability to use conditional formatting or expression-based formatting in Custom Visuals, which opened up a whole raft of new capabilities that I wanted to add into, into our icon map that I'd been waiting a very long time for. So I made the decision well, I, to be frank, I didn't have a lot of choice. In order to upgrade to that latest version of the Power BI API, there were so many 
changes in that API since the original one. I'd created icon mapping that essentially I had to start again and rewrite icon map from scratch. So for the last two or three months, I've started again with a blank canvas and rebuilt the visual completely from scratch. Um, yesterday, I released the first beta and my plan is that it will get relaunched into AppSource later this summer. And I've taken down the version that was in AppSource um, basically to prevent confusion um, and ensure that people are using this latest version. So let's have a very quick look at key features and then I'll move on to the demo. So start with the background maps. Obviously one of the key features of a, uh, a map is the map itself and icon map supports OpenStreetMap backgrounds. Um, it'll also let you use Mapbox if you have a Mapbox API key. Um, Ordnance Survey Maps were added this uh, this week. If you're based in the UK, they're probably one of the most popular types of maps that are available to all public sector organisations for free, um, and they haven't been available until now in Power BI. Um, but of course, if you've got your own map server, whether that's hosted up in the cloud or even on premises, you can use your own map server as a source for those background maps. Um, and we also support open standards uh, in terms of WMS or TMS layers too, or even if you just have a picture that you want to use as a map background, that is now also a possibility um, from the last couple of releases. Or if you want same kind of effect with shape map, but with more capabilities, then actually you don't need to have a background, a map in the background at all. Um, on top of those background maps, we can add some transparent layers. So Icon Map um, provides easy tip boxes to uh, enable nautical mapping, uh, rail networks, the daylight terminator curve, or you can provide your own from another source. And we'll have a look at those shortly. And then comes the objects that are bound to our Power BI data model, the things that are actually drawn on the map based on what's in our data. Those can include circles, images or icons, I guess, hence where icon map originally got its name. And those images can either be PNGs or vector images. Uh, we can draw lines, well-known text or WKT. And if you're not familiar with that, these are essentially polygons, line strings or points. And they're the same format that uh, SQL Server spatial data supports or Postgres can output. So particularly useful if you've got a database server in the background um, that supports geospatial functionality, Icon Map will support that natively. And then finally, um, GeoJSON layers. Um, so if you want to create a choropleth map where you've got lots of different shapes on the map or with different colors, or even just as a background reference layer, you can add those onto Icon Map. And the key feature is, it's not one or other of these different types of objects. You can create combinations and display them all at the same time on the map, if that's what you want to do. And I'll show you how to configure icon map with those different configurations. And the key thing really with this new latest release is the flexibility and control with expression-based formatting to have fine grain control of all of that individual behavior. And then finally, what was released yesterday was the ability to support different coordinate systems or even flat XY based maps. So even if you want to display something with all of that map functionality, the ability to zoom in and out, scroll around and put objects on it. Um, but either you're in a country where normal longitude and latitude coordinates don't really make sense, or um, perhaps it's not a map at all. Maybe it's an internal building plan then all of that is now possible. So let's jump out of PowerPoint then and have a look at some of uh, that functionality in demos. So I'm going to jump over now and pull in Power BI Desktop and we'll have a look at building a map up from scratch. And I quite like this example because this is one of the original um, use cases for for creating icon map in the first place so i've pulled in some data from the 
FlightAware API. Uh, essentially, FlightAware is an organization that tracks all of the location of the locations of all of the planes that are currently in flight and makes that available through an API or through a website hosted um, or map hosted on their website. But I've used the API and I've pulled out all of the planes that are currently flying. Um, I guess because of COVID, there aren't actually too many of them at the moment. Once upon a time, there would have been many, many thousands, but now there's just a few hundred. But let's see what we can do to put those on the map. So let me just talk through the data quickly. Um, I've got a flight ID. So this is a unique ID that is unique to each aircraft. Um, as returned by the API, it's also unique based on time too. I've got a longitude and latitude, so where that plane is currently on the globe. Um, I've just added in an account, I'll explain that in a moment, and a hard-coded image of a plane, and then the heading, which is a compass bearing, the direction that that plane is currently flying. So let's get started and add that information onto our map. So. I've downloaded Icon Map from the website. Um, I'll share that URL a little bit later. So let's place Icon Map on our report canvas and start dragging in our fields. Now there's two of these field wells that are absolutely mandatory regardless of what type of object you want to place on the map. And that is the category and the size field. So I'm gonna use our flight ID field as the category. So basically, this is the granularity that you want to show on a map. If you had a geographic hierarchy, you could choose something higher up that hierarchy and average out those longitude and latitude points. But we're going to work with the granular level data. So I'm going to drag in flight ID onto the report. Um, and I'm also going to drag that field into the size, which will basically just give me a count. It will just give a number one for um, every single plane, essentially, because I want them all to be the same size. And then we've got longitude and latitude, so let's drag those in as well. Latitude and longitude. And now we get circles for the locations of all of those different planes. But clearly, there are lots of map visuals in Power BI that can put circles on the map. Um, but I created icon map to put icons on the map. So let's have a look at how we turn those circles into that picture of a plane. So going into the formatting settings and under um, objects, you can see here we have the ability to um, assign an image or well-known text, but at, at this point we're going to have a look at images. And I could either type in that URL hard-coded into the text box here, or I can use conditional formatting to pick the field out of a data set. So let's do that. And I'm just going to choose that plane field, which will return that hard coded URL. And then straight away, our map is replaced by planes, but they're all a bit small. So let's make those a little bit bigger. Now, because all of our size values of number one every single plane is the same size which is the minimum size so i'm just going to increase that to 20. so now hopefully we can see our planes a little bit more clearly um but there's a bit of an issue with our planes they're all pointing north they all appear to be flying to the uh, north pole uh, but fortunately in our data set we have a heading we've got the um the compass bearing we know which angle those planes are pointing. So I can use that number to rotate our image of our planes around and hopefully have them pointing in the right direction. So you'll see here, we also have image rotation. Again, I could hard code a value if I want them all to point in the same direction, but I'm gonna use this heading field from the data. So let's pick that. And that will rotate all of our planes around. And now happily they're pointing in the right direction. So this is a good start. I can see where the planes are, but I can't really see where they're going. But I have got the destination information in this data set. And that comes with a longitude and latitude. So if I drag the longitude and latitude into these destination longitude and latitude fields, Icon Map will draw a line 
from our icon to that second pair of longitude and latitude coordinates. And by default, it will draw a straight line. But again, back here in our options, I can choose whether those lines should be straight or geodesic and follow the curvature of the Earth. So now I have some nice rounded lines. Um, and if I go into the formatting options, we can format those at the moment. Well, let's look at the colour. Um, we could change those. Let's make them dark blue instead of black, perhaps. Um, I can change the width of the line. So I can even make them thinner or or fatter, but let's stick with number one for now. I can change the transparency of them and I can go and set a dash array as well so I can change how those lines appear so we can do something like that. So now we've got a, a, a dot dash space going on in there. Um, and all of these settings are configurable through expression based formatting. So every individual object on your report can be a different line style or a different color or a different line thickness. So there's quite a lot of control in there now. And the same obviously applies to the colors. Lines only have um, the border color, but if you're plotting circles or um, polygons, then you can also change the fill color and the fill transparencies as well. So that's not a bad start for our map, but we could go a little bit further in here and add a overlay as well. So I talked a little bit about these in the introduction. Um, we can add on some nautical information or railway network information. That's not really relevant for our planes. Um, one of the things we could turn on is a daylight terminator. So we can see um, which parts of the world are in darkness and which are in daylight. And um, at the moment, this is live, how it is right now. And if, if I zoom in far enough on here, if I zoom all the way in, hopefully, you can see that that curve will update its location every second as it slowly moves across the map. However, if your data is based on historic data rather than being live, as most Power BI reports are, then if you have that date and time in your data set, then you can drag it into the daylight date and time field here and the um, the time in your data can be reflected in that daylight curve. It won't move across the map, but it will um, it will use that date and time to show how it looked back then. Um, I'm going to add a custom overlay in here, though, as well. So um, I'm going to turn that custom overlay on, and then here we get the option to paste in a custom uh, map URL. So I've got a subscription to openweathermap.org, which provides real-time weather maps as a map service. So I'm going to paste in the URL from their API in here. And now I get real-time weather overlaid onto my map as well. And perhaps we can see um, whether some of those planes are going to be traveling into stormy conditions, perhaps. So that's a bit of an introduction as to the the original features of Icon Map and why I created it in the first place. Let's move that one out of the way for a moment and jump into a different data set and I'll talk through some some different features in Icon Map. So this is a different data set. Um, this data set is based on um, property sales. Uh, this is open data from the UK's land registry, and I downloaded a file of every single property sale that's happened in the UK this year. And there's quite a lot of them. Um, and in that property data, we've got uh, the location of a property and the price it's sold for, and some other information about um, what sort of property it is. Um, but we don't have a longitude and latitude in here. Um, the lowest level of information we've got is postcode, which I seem to have managed to. Oh, there we are. Um, so I've also brought in some other open data to take that postcode and. Um, I mean, I think just from return from the this longitude view, I think latitude. What would be quite useful? I think Rishi, would you like to go on mute if that's you? I can hear in the background. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so sorry, where was I? Um, 
so yeah, I've got a lookup file in to return as longitude and latitude uh, for the center point of each of those postcodes, because icon map doesn't have the ability to go off and look up an, any address information and return back a longitude and latitude itself, like some of the out of the box visuals do. So we have to provide those longitudes and latitudes ourselves. So let's have a look at what that looks like. Now, I'm going to struggle here if I start trying to display all of the um, property sales in the UK. Um, I think there's something like 88,000 of them, but Icon Map um, is limited to displaying 30,000 points at any one time. Um, frankly, because uh, firstly, when you start going over that amount, performance starts to suffer, but also that's a hard limit for Power BI visuals at the moment. So uh, at the moment, Icon Map will only display 30,000 points. So I'm going to cheat and focus our uh, property sales on London. So I've also pulled up the uh, area of London um, as one of my lookup fields. So if I exclude blank, that will exclude all of the properties that haven't mapped to a London borough. So let's let's focus on London and we'll start off with London boroughs as our grouping. So even though our data is down at postcode level, if I pull in the London boroughs, it will average out all of those longitudes and latitudes to the centre point of each London borough. And let's use the property price and we need to change that to an average probably as our um, as our size measure. And what that size measure does is it changes the size of our circles. So obviously the smaller the price, the smaller the circle. And let me just show you some additional options around here as well, because we've got um, based on feedback from earlier versions of Icon Map, I've changed the circle size behavior in here. So at the moment I'm using the property price, which if I hover over the city of London here as being the highest average price at wow, just over five million pounds as the average price for property sold in the city of London versus what looks like the smallest circle, this one here in Barking and Dagenham, which is 353,000 pounds, which is still a lot of money. Um, it will take those price values and spread them between 10 pixels and 50 pixels of um, the size of our circles. However, if you want the behavior to be different and you have a measure value that has an exact size of the circle you want to plot, so say you want to have some that are 10 pixels and some that are 50 pixels, rather than spreading them across a range, then if you choose explicit rather than relative, these two boxes disappear and it will show um, the sizes um, that are held in your data. Obviously, it doesn't work for my data set because it's going to try and draw a, a circle that's 5 million pixels across, which is uh, way more than my monitor will allow. Uh, but you get the idea there. So that's that's one level of flexibility on the circle formatting. The other requirement that I've heard quite a lot is people want to plot a circle of a fixed size on the map. Um, and this is the same behavior currently as in all the other visuals I think is you zoom in even though um, we're zooming in to show a lot less space on the map the circle sizes stay the same um, as you zoom in um, so we also have the option in here for circle sizes to behave as they are now so the static size when zoomed or you can use your measure value to represent an actual size in meters so if you wanted a, um, a, a kilometer across circle, then if you had a measure value of a thousand, as you zoomed in and out, that circle would still represent a, a kilometer, um, regardless of the zoom level of the map. So if you want to show radius or travel distances from a certain point on the map, then that becomes quite useful. And of course, you can choose that um, on a circle by circle level. Um, with expression based formatting as well. So if you want some circles to change, but others to uh, to zoom in and out, then you can you can have both of those behaviors on the same map. So I just thought it was worth pointing out that additional functionality. Um, also on here, um, as I showed earlier, you can change the colors, but of course you can choose expression based formatting as well 
to um, to change those uh, circle colors. Um, not only the internal color, but also the border color as well. And unlike the earlier versions of Icon Map, now we have conditional formatting out of the box in Power BI. We can use the uh, standard conditional formatting in Power BI to do that, or obviously choose a field value with a RGB hex code already in it. Um, all works out. We probably need to uh, choose uh, price, average of price um, to represent our circle colors, and then it should match the circle sizes. So the darker the color, the uh, higher the price. Um, but this is all very well. We're still showing circles, um, and we can quite happily do this with the Bing Maps visual. Um, admittedly, only up to three and a half thousand points, but um, it, you can still achieve this uh, kind of map in the Bing Maps visual. So Let's have a look at a different piece of functionality and move on and have a look at how we might add a geojson layer onto our map. So I've got some geojson layers hosted um, on an external web server. So let's turn on geojson and paste in the URL of my geojson file. And now we can see that we are plotting the, the boundary information, the shapes that make up those London boroughs, in addition to our circles. However, the at the moment it's just being treated as reference information. It's just drawing the uh, the outlines of those boroughs behind our circles, because we haven't told Icon Map yet how to relate our London borough name back to our GeoJSON file. What we need to do is tell icon map that actually it's the geojson layer that we want to reference and not the circles so if i remove out the longitude and latitude data from here then our uh, geojson file will now um, take on those those fill colors and actually there's a slight bug here which i will fix tomorrow um, where the map doesn't refresh when you take those longitude and latitude values off, it's actually fine um, apart from when you're configuring it. Um, so I'll just flip backwards and forwards to refresh the map and you'll see now that our circles have disappeared and our shading is now applied to the um, the London Borough geojson outlines. Um, and you can do this in shape map and actually we can have the same behavior as shape map by turning off those background layers if we wanted to, but what you can't do in shape map is add a drill down capability. So what we can do in icon map is choose up to five levels of drill down. So if I add a second level in there, you'll see we get a second text box to add in another GeoJSON file. So if I paste that in there, and we add in a level down on our geographic hierarchy, in here and again this is another little bug related that i need to fix tomorrow that doesn't refresh the map as i come in here now i have the ability to drill down and if i click on one of these london boroughs we now drill down to that much more detailed level of um of geographic boundaries and you can see here that i'm plotting all of those detailed uh, more detailed shapes for the whole of London. Um, so let me show you some of the formatting options for those. Um, at the moment, we've chosen to show all of the, the geojson shapes, even those that now aren't related to the data because we've drilled down to one particular borough, Westminster, but we're still showing them for the rest of London. So I can I can turn those off and they'll disappear. And I would recommend doing that if you don't need them because map performance will be better. Um, um, but if you do want to keep those on as a reference layer, you can change the, um, the fill color and the line color of uh, those inactive ones in here. If you want to change, obviously, the colors of the active ones that are related to the data, then um, you need to use those formatting options there. Let's put our map background layer back on though, because that is one thing you can't do with the shape map. 
and I'll tell you what, I'll turn those off. This other switch here, by the way, um, is whether to include these inactive uh, geojson shapes in the automatic zoom. So if I turn that off, our uh, zoom will take into account all of these shapes, even though they don't have any data related to them. Turn it back off and it will only zoom based on the ones that do have data. But let's turn those off for now. Um, so we've got map backgrounds here. We can drill up and down. Um, again, that we can't do in shape map. Um, let's have a look at some other features while we've got this map on here. Um, I've been fiddling with the background layer as I've been demoing this, uh, but you'll notice there's expression based formatting option here, even on the background layer. So what I can do is dynamically change the background layer, either based on a slicer. So if you wanted a, uh, you know, a, a pretty uh, ability to change the background layer between these different options um, and allow the user to change the background layer on the map, then you could create a quick slicer for them to do that. Um, or you can automatically change the background layer uh, based on something either like drill down level or maybe I don't know, you're using some bespoke drone footage and you want, um, I don't know, maybe it's drone footage of a wind farm, for example, and you want one set of drone footage from one server uh, for one wind farm and it's all on a different server for another wind farm. You can dynamically uh, change that in the map based on, um, based on the measure in your data. Um, so I've got a very simple measure on here uh, based on whether we're showing more than one um, like one London borough, uh, it will change the background map. So, so let me add that onto the map quickly. So I'm going to hit expression based formatting and choose that measure that I've created, uh, which is in, where is it? Postcode lookups, background map. And now you'll see it's automatically flipped to the gray map. And then if I drill down to that more detailed level in the data, you'll see that we've got this open topo map. Uh, background in here with all of the building outlines shown in dark grey. Go back up and we go back to the grey map again. So that's just an example of that working. Um, I also mentioned while we're here talking about background layers that um, we support open source um, OGC formats as well as TMS or in this case WMS. So let me show you what um, a WMS layer might look like on here as well. So I'm going to pull in some deprivation data to show here on our map as well. So I'm going to paste in the WMS server address and choose which layer from the server I want to show. And now we'll also get a um, deprivation layer shown on our map as well. Um, obviously, we want to play with the transparency levels of our um, geojson layer as well so we can see that effectively um, but there's lots of formatting options on here too uh, you can change the transparency of this wms layer um, and you can also change that dynamically as well based on uh, expression-based formatting so you can dynamically choose different wms layers um, and this is a image layer you can pull in svg layers as well if you want it all to be vectored um, some of these will need additional attribution on the bottom of your map so you can add that in, in there too and you'll see that it appears on the bottom if you need to satisfy any copyright conditions for using different background maps and you can always add those on here in the map control section by um, adding further attributions in here too um, i should probably show as well while we're in map controls you can turn all of the controls on and off on the map there's a scale in the bottom left hand corner if you want it um, also support lasso select uh, and if these are a bit imposing on your map and you want them to be smaller you can customize the size of all of the controls as well to make them smaller or bigger perhaps if you're creating a, uh, a finger friendly report for a touch screen okay so <sighs> talked about backgrounds um i think the interesting thing about um, this deprivation information on here is that it covers the whole of England and Wales. Um, I should, yeah, 
England, maybe just England, but still, it covers a vast area um, of of the country with really detailed shapes. Now we can't do that realistically with a geojson layer. Not necessarily, well, not only because icon map would struggle in terms of performance, but also because the actual file size containing all of those um, polygons would just be too big to load in one go into icon map. In order to have those shapes data bound and interactive with our Power BI data model, we need to actually store those shapes inside the Power BI data model and only display the relevant ones at a time. And we can do that in icon map by using well-known text objects. So um, if you remember back from the quick intro, these are either polygons, points, or line strings um, that are held in our data set and we can plot those on the map. So let me show you a couple of examples of those. So let me very quickly just go back to the flight map because actually um, there's one other bit of information I pulled out from our FlightAware API um, other than the, uh, the plane's location and its destination. For some of the planes, I was also able to pull back a line string representing the flight plan that the, uh, they filed uh, before the plane took off. So let's just for now remove our destination longitude and latitude, although we could still display those as well. Uh, but for clarity, I'm going to take that off. And in our data, you'll see that for some of our flights, we have this waypoint data as well, which is just a line string of longitude and latitude coordinates representing that flight path. So if I go back into our map configuration, and um, in order to do this, the, the well-known text information, our line strings, need to be on a, a second row of data. So um, let me find a sensible example where they're next to each other on the map. Um, always difficult to do these things on the fly. Sort by flight ID. So here we've got um, AFR 429. We've got two rows in our data set. One has the longitude and latitude um, to plot our image. The other one has no longitude and latitude, but it does have the line string. So we need two separate rows in our data set to draw both the plane icon and its flight path. So I've got a measure that either returns back the plane URL or the well-known text field, depending on um, which of those rows it is. So let's remove our image field and replace it with that plain or waypoints measure and now oh god there's too many planes in the sky let's see if we can pick see if i can get lucky and pick one that has a icon and a flight path there weren't too many of them um united airlines there we go that's a good one. Oh no united emirates plane but that one is flying here from um wherever that is i should have chosen a uh, background layer with English text on it. So you can see the flight path was filed to go right over here, but the plane is actually not quite on its intended flight path. They must have asked for uh, permission to change that either just before they took off or during flight. But you can see that those lines don't always follow a perfect curve. You see, we've got some real kinks going on in here in that data set, according to those line strings. Um, Yeah, not going to be lucky enough to pick a random one, but you you get the idea. So that's line strings. Now let me show you a bit of an example of using that property data, uh, but pulling in all of those polygons into our uh, Power BI data model. So this one's hosted up in the Power BI service. So let me let me show you this one. So this is the same data set, but actually there's a lot more data than I was using in Power BI Desktop. I've actually got all of the property sales for 15 years for every property in London in this data set. And we've got our same local authority, our London Borough Boundaries in here, but this time they are represented as well-known text, so polygon rather than a line string. And as you'd expect, I can click on these and all of the other visuals will update on our report. But let me drill through to 
a more detailed view and I just want to show some of the capabilities of what else we can do um, when we start using well-known text. So on this one, and the reason it's taken a moment to render is I haven't just pulled back um, these fairly high level polygons. So you can see here I've got two icon maps on the page. I'm using one as a, a um, slicer for the main map, a bit of a mini map where you can click on and zoom in. But I've actually pulled in the polygons representing every single building in London into my data model from OpenStreetMap data. So I can actually plot a heat map here um, based on those property prices. So you can actually see, you know, exactly which properties were the most expensive ones um, in this area of London. And to show those a little bit more clearly, instead of drawing that as a heat map, um, I've got a different measure that change, that's changing those fill colors um, based on the type of object. So, well, let's, let's click on one of this and zoom right in and hopefully we'll see. I've got all of your individual building outlines now as items in my data, even trees and parks, schools, railways. Let's um, zoom back out again. And let me just zoom in manually and hopefully you'll see. Um, the other, of course, advantage of this is I can actually, well, I can use report page tooltips firstly to pull out additional information about those properties that's also in my data set. And as I move over different items here, you can see we've got various information about what those objects are. But I can even click on them and get the average selling price for that particular building over time. So, um, you know, there's a huge amount of capability here when you start using um, well-known text in your data. And I've I've loaded in millions and millions and millions of different objects here into the Power BI data set. And I'm just using a slicer effectively to only show the ones that I'm interested in a bit of a time. And even if you couldn't fit in all of those polygons into your Power BI data set, you know, um, there's nothing to stop you using a composite model and pulling those directly out of um, spatial data in SQL Server or, or Postgres on the fly as you need to show them on the map. So there really is no limit as to how many uh, polygons that you can hold in Power BI and display on the map. So that's well-known text. Um, hopefully I've given you a bit of a flavor of what we can do there. Um, but I'm conscious that on most of these maps, I've only really shown one type of object uh, on the map at a time. So let me just explain how we can create combinations of objects. So I've got a really simple data set here, seven rows of data, and each of those rows of data uh, represents seven items on my um, on my map. Although actually I've got a geojson line in here and I don't actually have any geojson on the map, but I think we've we've covered that. So let's have a very quick look at these one by one. So firstly, we've got a circle, this one here. So to draw a circle on the map, we need to um, configure latitude and longitude and have a size. Um, that is the minimum configuration for a circle. And I've also um, provided a line width here in the formatting. So this circle's got a border of one. Um, and something I haven't explained actually is um, you can choose if I go back to the map formatting options on an item by item basis, whether each item in your data set should show a tooltip or not. So let me just, oops, pull that back down. So you can see here, um, I've got expression based formatting on tooltip. So uh, this one here is showing a tooltip, um, but I've got this image, which is this dinosaur here. Uh, set to not show a tooltip. So if I mouse over that one, no tooltip, mouse over this one or any of the other map objects, we do get a tooltip. So uh, that can be quite useful if you want map objects that are like reference information that just form part of the map itself, but still come out of your Power BI data set and are rendered dynamically, then you can differentiate between those. Um, likewise, you can also use expression-based formatting to say whether you want an item to be selectable on the map or not. Um, so again, if it's a reference item, you might not want anybody to be able to select it. So you can turn that off on an item by item basis. Um, so that's circles. To 
to draw a line, um, you need the origin longitude and latitude and the destination longitude and latitude and the size. Um, the size is used to, to draw a circle at the origin. If you don't want a circle at the origin and you just want a line on its own, then you can quite happily turn that off in the objects menu here. Um, and now it's disappeared. The reason we've still got a circle showing there in the background is actually we've got a well-known text point in the same place as, as that other circle would have been. Um, while we're at well-known text, um, in order to show well-known text on the map, we don't provide longitude and latitude. We still need to provide a size because it's a mandatory field, although it's not used at all. And um, we obviously have to provide the well-known text as conditional formatting. Um, also worth noting on here that is I've provided a label. So again, this is something I don't think you can do in any of your other Power BI map visuals, but we can put text on the map. So um, again, through expression-based formatting, you can provide custom text for each of the map objects, and there's fairly fine-grained control of um, how that text appears. Oops. So for example, if we want our little box there to have rounded corners, I can, I can turn that on, for example. And then finally, I've got two images. Um, I've got image of a dinosaur down here. Um, these images are vector-based, so they don't degrade as they get bigger or smaller. They're SVG files. Images can either be a URL like this to an external HTTPS source, or you can 64-bit encode them and store them in your data set. Or if they're uh, SVGs, you can actually just hold the SVG um, itself, you know, the XML um, in a measure and use that in its native format. Um, and this one here uh, is actually the same config. So we've got longitude and latitude of where to display it, the size you want the image to be, uh, the URL, and um, again, for expression-based formatting, if you want, need to rotate it, um, you can provide a rotation value. So that's combinations of objects. Um, while we're on this data set, though, I want to talk about um, what happens if your coordinate system isn't longitudes and latitudes. So in my data set for our house prices, obviously we've been using longitudes and latitudes um, up to now, but I've also got ordnance survey eastings and northings in this case, which are, uh, let me show you, they are uh, these values here, they're six digit X and Y coordinates. So let's see how we can use those uh, to be shown on icon map. So let's configure our map again quickly. Let's, I don't know, um, doesn't really matter what we show. Let's use, um, I guess we can stick with London, do London boroughs. And for now, I'll stick with longitudes and latitudes, but I'll explain why in a moment. And property price as our size. So here we're back with our circles. We've still got um, OpenStreetMap as our background layer. So I'm going to go in here and choose a custom URI for our map server. And I'm going to use the Ordnance Survey API as my source, which has got a custom key embedded into it. And the zoom level on this, I think goes between naught and nine, something like that. So I can, if your background maps are only provided to certain zoom levels, you can specify those there. Um, but the reason it's not showing anything on here is that Ordnance Survey doesn't use those longitudes and latitude coordinates. It uses these British National Grid coordinates. So I'm gonna choose that on here. Um, and it populates all of these other options for me using that new map projection and coordinate system. And obviously I'm showing UK here, where I've got it pre-filled in, but actually this works for other coordinate systems anywhere in the world. And um, as long as you provide these items in here, it will work with other coordinate systems as well. So here now we've got ordnance survey map, um, ordnance survey maps here in the background, uh, which are quite popular as I mentioned earlier in the UK. Um, but I'm still plotting my data using longitude and latitude coordinates. Icon map is translating our longitudes and latitudes automatically for us into our new coordinate system, our 27700 coordinate 
British national grid coordinates. But if our coordinates are already in that format, so let me swap these to our X and Y, whoops, six digit coordinates, then I can still use those on the map. Just back down here in our coordinate options, I just tell it to reproject those coordinates to longitudes and latitudes, and now we can use those um, alternate coordinates to plot items on our map as well. And this works for all of the different types of map objects, um, whether it's polygons or geojson layers, um, it will go through and translate those coordinates for you. So that's Auden survey maps, but what happens if we don't actually have a real map in our background at all? What happens if we just want to pick our own picture? So you'll notice we've also got a simple XY um, coordinate system that we can use. And if you choose that, then you get to just pick a, um, an image in its own right to use as a background layer. So let me just give you some quick inspiration of what that might look like. So first of all, I've pulled in from one of the UK train operators, their network map was just a picture, but it's still an icon map. I can still zoom in and out. Um, and I'm showing the locations of the trains using um, images, same way as I was with the planes. And when this train gets to a station, it shows a tooltip um, or a label rather. Um, and it's animated just by using the play axis custom visual to pick out a particular point in time. Um, so that's one example. And then I've got one other as well to show quickly. If I haven't lost it. So this one's based on Legoland in the UK. I've just pulled in their park map. So it's still a map, but it's um, obviously not a geographic map. So these X, Y coordinates start with zero, zero here in this bottom left hand corner. And on my park map, there's two things going on. Um, I seem to have an alert here on this ride, or I've got a lost child down here, little Tom Jones who needs rescuing. So let's have a quick look where our entertainers are. So I've got one entertainer here and one here. This one actually looks like it's going to be the closest. So let me use a lasso select to highlight those entertainers and use my power automate button to task that entertainer to go and rescue Tom Jones. Now I can focus here on my uh, ride. So let's have a look what ride that is. Looks like it's Hydra's challenge. What's going on on Hydra's challenge? So got a little tooltip on here that's showing me that there's a wait time of 50 minutes, but the ride's closed with 400 people in the queue. So we need to get that fixed ASAP. Let's have a look at what's going on in that part of the park. Well, we've got an average queue time of 40 minutes and over a thousand visitors waiting. So there's definitely not capacity in this part of the park to pick up those waiting visitors. So uh, let's have a look where our maintenance engineers are. So got one here and one down here. Let's have a look at their maintenance routine. So you can see that this one's headed down there and this one's headed up here. So actually we could task maintenance engineer two to go and fix that ride quickly. But all of these objects are just using the same icon map features that I've been demoing throughout the rest of the presentation. Images, um, labels, our, our polygons, um, and um, circles, if I turn back on the attractions as well, they're just circles with obviously the usual features of report page tooltips. So huge amount of potential there for doing things like internal building plans or all sorts of other things that don't necessarily use true um, map coordinates. So I've run through the demos. Um, so what's coming next? Well. You can go and play with all of this now. It's available to download right now from iconmap.com. Um, there's some blog posts up there that I started writing in the last couple of weeks that show some of those new features, uh, but I'm still updating the documentation for this latest release. Um, next release will be in the next few days, which will have those couple of bug fixes that I found whilst creating these demos this morning, um, um, and one or two other small bug fixes. And then my plan is to release that at the end of the summer to app source so that it's available in the custom visuals marketplace. 
Um, but that's not the end of the story. There's lots of new features that I still want to build in, such as support for vector tiles, uh, improved layering of items within the map so you can control um, what appears on top of what other objects, um, and a lot more uh, granularity on how um, those labels can be um, placed on the map. Um, and then I also had the idea of creating a whole new visual with a lot of these features built in, but is actually a slicer, um, so a map slicer visual. But there we go. So that is um, pretty much out of time, I think, but hopefully that was useful and has given you some um, a new tool for your uh, mapping toolbox in, in Power BI. Um, Uh, are there any questions? Spun silence. First of all, <laughs> uh, thanks a lot, James, for this uh, really interesting introduction into um, how you can use the maps. And uh, yeah. If there is any questions uh, from anyone participating, um, please just go ahead, unmute yourself, and ask whatever is in question. There is a question in the chat. Yeah, OK. So if you're a data person and want to learn more of a map language that would let us unlock this potential, where would you steer us? GIS knowledge of it. Yeah, it's a really good question. So there's a really hard balance when building these visuals between creating capability and also making it really complicated to use. And I think I've, I've probably shown a lot of the really complicated and difficult features <laughs> that use a lot of that map language in here. But actually, if you want to start, um, it's actually relatively straightforward to start building a lot of these features without needing to know necessarily what WMS layers are or um, different coordinate reference systems and all of that. If you just want to start using general maps, then hopefully um, it's fairly accessible. Um, and I am hopefully going to start publishing more blogs and more video content and, and more guides on how to use all of this on the icon map website. In terms of um, learning the general language. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Um, let me have a think and I'll, um, sounds like a subject for a, uh, a blog post. Uh, I'm still learning it. I'm no maps expert myself. Um, I've kind of uh, had to learn a lot of these features of people have been asking for them and try and understand what they are and then, and then build them into the map. Any? Hi, James. It's me. Hi. Hi, me. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, so one thing I think I, I mean, it's, it's really amazing what you can do with the, with with this this tool. I, what I what I usually struggle with is finding data is just even just for learning. So so that this kind of data that I can use. So that I think what would be really useful for me and I hopefully for others also is just knowing where can you you know finding this data, converting you know your data into a coordinate system that is usable or, or can be used for icomap so so that kind of how you yeah you know how you can find the sources because you know without the source it's really hard to just learn or even just yeah. learn ICOMAP, but I, also I, I yeah. understand yeah so i think open source data is a fantastic resource for um for geographic data um in the uk we've got um we've got the National um, Office for National Statistics um, that has opened up lots of open source data, but also um, in in Europe, you know, all of the governments have a mandate to make um, data available as Eurostat in Europe that equally makes lots of those data sets available and a lot of them have geographic information in them. But like you say, um, particularly in the UK where um, most public sector data sets don't have longitude and latitude data. They they use different coordinate systems. In the UK, it's Ordnance Survey. Um, I think um, there's a couple of really useful tools to know. One is a website called 
mapshaper.org, which um, is brilliant for converting between different formats of spatial data, whether it's GeoJSON files or CSV lists of coordinates. You can you can drag those in there and and um, translate them to other um, types of object. And then there is also a, um, a hugely popular um, open source um, um, spatial tool called QGIS, which is uh, completely free and um, massively powerful. And you can either create your own layers or convert between different um, different types of geography or coordinate systems using QGIS. It's a bit hard to get your head around initially, but there's so many video guides on YouTube on how to use it because it's such a widely used tool. But it's a fat client. It's um, it's a proper Windows program, not a website. So um, you do need to be able to install software on your machine to be able, in order to be able to use it. But it's it's hugely hugely powerful. Um, so I would I would head for open source for map data to play with and experiment with. Um, and then MapShaper and QGIS are my uh, my tools of sort of uh, choice for playing with map data. Thank you. Oh, I've just realized I've been trying to show things on the screen um, that <laughs> I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but uh, let me stick those URLs in the chat. There we go. So that one is QGIS and um, mapshaper.org is the other one. There we go. Okay. I think that might be it if there are no other questions. Yes, I don't think um, there's, there's anything else, no other questions. Uh, then um, let me say uh, thanks again, uh, James, for this uh, really interesting introduction and uh, your magnificent presentation of, of the maps. And um, thanks uh, everyone for being here. Our next meetup will be on the 8th September. Um, you can see uh, the, the next dates on your screen. And as always, um, you can bot, uh, watch the, the um, recording of this, uh, which will be posted on YouTube, or uh, you can also find it in the meetup channel. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much again for having me. and. I hope that was a, a useful session and uh, your uh, your lineup looks amazing for your next three sessions. Thank you. And uh, as, as, as you see, you were feared of uh, multiple demos, but they all went smoothly at the end. <laughs> or at least I made it look that way, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you. And Actually, everybody see you after the summer. I think, as, as uh, James just said, the lineup is pretty exciting. And we are also having some uh, surprises for October and November. So stay tuned on Meetup channel. Yeah. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Auf Wiedersehen.